me to this conference uh, uh, to speak on the subject matter that has, uh, in my, in the impression that I got uh, from having observed the discourse on Ukraine here in the United States, but most importantly also in Ukraine, uh, has been uh, missing from uh, the picture of the situation in Ukraine. And by that I mean the, the issue of language. Language, uh, and I should warn you that I am uh, an interested party, if only because I, I teach Ukrainian uh, at Columbia. I have done so since 2004. Uh, and uh, compared to how important language has always been for uh, the history of Ukrainian liberation movement, starting with the uh, first uh, manifestations of it in the late 19th century and on to the emergence of the first independent Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian People's Republic in 1918, and on to the OUN, uh, uh, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, uh, then Ukrainian dis dissident movement of the 1960s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, what we see today is something quite different. Something that I see as a change, a paradigmatic change in how uh, Ukrainian identity uh, comes increasingly to be redefined these days. Uh, if we talk about politicians, what has happened is that with the exception of the fringe, uh, uh, of fringe parties like uh, the Sloboda, uh, who <coughs> is variously called all kinds of names, but let me remind to you that even if they are called fascists or neo-Nazis or whatever it is, 1.4% of Ukrainian electorate supported them. To talk about them would be like talking about the United States, talking about Ku Klux Klan and nothing else. That would give you the objective picture of the United States. Uh, so uh, everybody else seems to be afraid of talking what is in fact a deep root of the discontent, the social movement that, is, that has happened in Ukraine. Namely, that the majority of Ukrainian citizens who consider their language to be uh, Ukrainian, their mother tongue, have been uh, consistently discriminated against on the language uh, issue, are uh, denied what other titular nations in other European states, in other uh, modern states, including this one, has taken for granted. Namely, having their children uh, educated in their own language, going to schools that, at the end of the educational process, would produce an individual speaking the language in its full wealth and variety, having their own national cinema, films made about them, about their history, about their own stories, not somebody else's, in their own language, having book publishing that reflects the proportional part of those people in general population, having television, mass media, internet, and I can go on and on and on. Uh, what has been done, uh, why is such a change? Why is uh, Ukrainian, uh, why we are afraid talking about Ukraine? Partially this is function of the domination of Russian ideology and right, Russian view in Ukrainian mass media, whereby talking about this disproportion uh, or the kind of increasing marginalization of Ukraine in the public sphere is tantamount to dividing Ukraine. To uh, kind of setting one part of Ukrainians 
namely Ukrainian speakers, against the other, naming, uh, namely Russian speakers. And this is a kind of a political wisdom that is espoused across the board, with small exceptions that I mentioned. Uh, the fight that we are now witnessing, the war, Ukrainian-Russian war, has always been waged in the sphere of culture. And language was on the receiving end, always, starting with the Emskukas uh, in, the, in the 1860s and on to all kinds of measures that uh, were aimed at marginalizing and finally ousting, reducing Ukrainian language to irrelevance or simply making it the language that is dead. And these tools, we can talk about two types of uh, such strategies applied. Uh, in the old so uh, Russian Empire, those were simply prohibition, prohibiting Ukrainian to be used in public spheres, in strategic public spheres, education, politics, business, book publishing, and so on. Under the Soviets, this kind of thing was finessed. You couldn't be openly discriminatory uh, towards the language, so what was done was making it uh, expressly uncomfortable for people insisting on, what, uh, on speaking their own language in public sphere. Those of you who grew, up, who grew up under the Soviet Union remember very well the phrase, she or he demonstratively speaks Ukrainian. Have any of you Americans <coughs> heard anybody say that in, in the United States about you? Why do you demonstratively speak English? Ukrainians uh, have experienced that kind of situation uh, all along. What the Soviets invented, what other colonialists did not, was a very specifically Soviet way of destroying the language, of assimilating it. Namely, they started interfering within the system <coughs> of the language, destroying its originality, uh, forbidding entire <coughs> hundreds of words morphological endings, syntactic constructions, and even uh, certain ways of pronunciation that ha were considered to be normal standard, and declaring them either nationalist, or archaic, or dialectal, and thus deserving of not being used. They started interfering within the system of the language itself, bringing it in greater kind of similarity to the Russian language. The result of such a, an engineering was making the end product of such an influence to sound like a very poor, impoverished version of the great Russian language. A young person or an old person hearing such a crippled language would not choose it. They would opt for, for a better language, for a richer language. Now, with the, with the arrival of independence, all these things seem to be impossible to continue to do. Not so. In, uh, in fact, what we are seeing now uh, is a very uh, effective modification of such, uh, of, of such uh, assimilation as pressures on Ukrainian. And I wanted just to speak about one of them which is incredibly effective and, uh, if not to say, lethal for Ukraine. I call this new strategy that has been uh, formulated and very uh, successfully applied uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm talking about coercive bilingualism. It presupposes the framing of the entire Ukrainian uh, nation into a communicative setting where both Ukrainian and Russian are used at the same time. Indiscriminately mixing, <coughs> mixed, within the time frame of five, ten minutes. You hear this mixture imposed on you everywhere, particularly on television. Some historians say that the Russian, the Tsarist regime failed to uh, Russify Ukraine uh, absurdly or ironically because Ukraine was basically an illiterate country. Educational system could not reach everybody to Russify them. Now, 
television is the tool that is pervasive. It reaches every crack of society. There's no running away a television show, a prime time, very popular television show. Two anchors are speaking, one Ukrainian, one Russian. Very often Ukrainian is poor, is translated from Russian, whereas Russian is, sounds very nice, attractive, rich, and in a way that wants you to imitate it. The, the, the consumer of such a cultural product comes away with the impression that Ukrainian is a second-rate language. Now, what the Soviets tried to do by destroying the language from within, for that they needed to destroy, physically kill Ukrainian linguists, destroy Ukrainian school of linguistics, and start producing dictionaries and all kinds of materials that would present Ukrainian as a, as a pale version of Russian. Now you don't have to do that. What is done now is uh, marginalize the entire uh, community of Ukrainian linguists, defund them, stop funding Ukrainian is the Institute of Ukrainian Language, and make them in irrelevant. And then uh, the standard, of the, the very standard of the language that needs to be regulated and guarded, and at e each country has an institution, whether it's a government-run institution or a society-run institution. Uh, your country has such an institution it's called Chicago Book of Style, if, if you didn't hear about that. <laughs> In Ukraine, that institution does not exist. So, who does what? The journalists. The journalists use whichever language they like. The very s notion of literary standard is non-existent in Ukraine now. Language is, as a result, showing signs of a cardiac arrest. I'm, I'm saying it in a kind of a rhetoric, exaggerated way, but there are signs of Ukrainian language shutting down its mechanisms of world crea word creation, linguistic innovation. Never in the history of Ukrainian language uh, there was a tendency of massive borrowing of unneeded foreign words. Why unneeded? Because they have already been borrowed and assimilated before. Like aktia, a Ukrainian word. Now you see the, the word action. Without a similar action, and then decline. The action, the film genre action, or account, or a number of other things as if the language lost its ability to adopt the borrowed words. Other things is Ukrainian, unlike any other European language, including Russian, doesn't have such important areas of blood <coughs> production, so to speak, as slang and colloquial language. Colloquial language may exist in books. You won't hear it anywhere in the public space. It is progressively supplanted, replaced, by the macaronic mixture of Russian and Ukrainian, which is called surzik. And so now we are looking at the possibility, a historical kind of rarity, when within the lifespan of just one generation, we are seriously entertaining the possibility of a big European language disappear if nothing is done. And so uh, I, I leave this. Uh, there are many other ways of talking about Ukrainian, and I haven't even started.